how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. To infinity and beyond. Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? It's classified. You talking to me? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I can't lie. Expecto Patronum. Entertainment X. You never know what you're going to get. For this episode, I sit down and chat with Trinity Wheeler. Trinity is an executive producer at Networks Presentations, which I just worked for in the company of Waitress. He's also working on Les Mis, set to resume after the pandemic, and upcoming Hairspray and 1776, with Diane Paulus directing. We talk about... All of it. We talk about his relationship with pain. We talk about his work ethic. We talk about his journey and path to producing. This is a wonderful, wide-ranging conversation that I very much enjoyed, and I hope you do as well. So, enjoy and keep on keeping on. We're back. I'm Clayton Howe, and today with me on the phone is Trinity Wheeler. Trinity, thank you for chatting with me today. This is going to be fun. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I have wanted to have you on the show for a while now, considering multiple conversations that we've had in the backstage areas of different theaters across this great <laughs> nation. <laughs> Absolutely. Prior to the whole kerfuffle of this pandemic, which we don't have to focus on at this point in time, I think it'll be very interesting to see what the outcome is for live theater, as I'm sure you are as well. Yeah, you know, we're taking it a day at a time. Exactly. And that's, you but know, I, I, I'm confident at the end of all of it, we're going to come out on the other side better than we were. So we, we will learn a lot. I do. I, I think there's going to be a real surgence of, you know, live entertainment once everything yeah. is figured out, the safety protocols and what have you. It's going to be a real big deal. Uh, absolutely. Completely agree. I want to, I want to take it back to the beginning of time for you. What, mm. what were your theater dreams growing up? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because I, I kind of come from, I come from a small town in Texas and, um, I come from actually a rodeo family. Um, you know, no, no, no entertainment or performing arts at all in, in my family. My, my father was a professional bull rider. Um, no way. Yeah. That's what's, that's, that was, how, that was his thing. And, um, you know, so I grew, grew up after my dad retired from uh, riding bulls. He uh, we, he started raising rodeo stock, you know, bulls and shipping them around the country to, to various rodeos. And so, you know, that was sort of my life growing up when I was young was being around the farm and doing those sort of things. And, and my, actually stayed with my grandparents a lot of the time. And, um, you know, I, I, I started discovered music i was really into country music I, my first thing I, I i realized i had a voice pretty early on and, and i would sing the national anthem um at local rodeos you know around east texas and uh you know country music uh became my thing and i and i said to myself you know i was destined to be a a country western singer that's what i wanted to do <laughs> and um you know i i, I did that for years and then eventually, you know, started discovering musical theater, which I actually, I think it's very close to, to country music, right? It, 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 it's, uh, it's songs that tell great stories. And, um, and, and definitely what I've learned about theater and, and being a theater producer is that, you know, that's the goal is to tell a great story. And I love how country music does that. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I found a love for theater. Um, I started first you know, as a performer, um, and I, I did several shows. But in very early on, uh, when I graduated high school, had an opportunity um, to join um, uh, the Ice Capades, a show called Holiday on Ice, and they were looking for uh, singers that could skate, and I definitely couldn't skate. But I sang, and so I sent a demo tape in of uh, myself singing. I think I sang, like, Can You Feel the Love Tonight, some Elton John, something like that. And, uh, and they called me and said, hey, yeah, that's great. You can skate, though, right? I said, absolutely, I can skate. And, you know, can, can you be in New York in two weeks or something like that? And I was like, sure, no problem. I'll be there. So I went, uh, I went and, and got myself a pair of ice skates and went to the local ice rink we have there 
and um, I learned enough to be able to survive oh my going in into the ice show. You know, I didn't have to do tricks or anything like that, but I definitely had to be solid on my feet and, you know, sing and perform. And, and the show had, of course, you know, skaters from around the world in it, but I was one of the two singers on the show. And it was definitely adventure. I remember my first day uh, of rehearsal in the, like rehearsing at a hockey rink somewhere like in Oklahoma, I think. And uh, I left my guards on my blades and I like hit the ice and I busted my ass the first time. And it was just, it was like in front of all these ice <laughs> oh, no. skaters, like, oh, this is not going well. But no, I ended up doing Holiday on Ice. I loved it. Um, I did it. I ended up doing it, I think, for three seasons. Uh, so three years of that. And then, um, you know, I started getting, I was working for a really great producer that you know, gave me a lot of opportunity. And I, I started... I, I learned very early on that you know producing and the idea of of, of taking a, a story from from concept to creation um, was something that I was really interested in and wanted to learn more about. And I thought, you know, what better way? I've sort of experienced things as a performer, and what better way to learn more about the producing aspect than stage management? And um, I had never went to school for stage management, but I. Um, there was a national tour of Singing in the Rain um, that was coming up, produced by the same producer I was doing the ice show with. And I said, look, I want to try my hand at this stage managing thing. And, and he was, you know, he sort of knew my personality and my kind of my kind of take charge attitude. And he gave me an opportunity. So I went to, a, you could actually go into a bookstore back then. I went to Barnes and Noble. Um, and I got this book that was literally like how to be a stage manager and um i read that and um i'd been around you know enough shows to sort of know my way around it so i sort of faked it till i made it and uh you know took my first national tour out um as stage manager so um that's kind of where it all started and you know i've been very very lucky to have a career to where sort of one opportunity led to another and I, I, I kept stage managing other national tours, um, you know, eventually got my union card, um, continued that on shows. And then, you know, and gosh, 10 years ago, exactly now, um, you know, Les Rob came into my life and um, I became the PSM of Les Mis in 2010. And uh, I've worked on the show ever since I took it, uh, you know, the U.S. tour took it uh, to the Canadian company, and then eventually to Broadway. And um, and then after I finished Les Mis on Broadway, you know, this producing opportunity came up, which where my current job is with networks. And uh, I, it's been over five years now. It's crazy how quick time has flown. But um, yeah, man, that's that's kind of where it all. That was the whole journey of it. I, in some strange way it's so quick you're absolutely right how quick time goes and how much is achieved oh, yeah. in such a short amount of time from performing to stage managing and producing but st i was stage managing was a means to the end of producing for you it was because i really wanted to know how to construct a show and construct it from sort of all aspects uh you know working with designers working with creative teams how to, you know, what, what, a, what a show goes through. And what, what I found that I had a talent for early on was being able to see the big picture. You know, a lot of times when we work on stuff, we get so focused on, on details that we sort of forget the whole scope of what we're doing and what we're, we're going after. But I've always sort of had the, the talent of being able to step back and look at something from, you know, 30,000 feet and, and make informed decisions um, and, and and drive a project forward. And so that's what I really loved about stage management. And I also thought, you know, I've had this experience as a performer. I've done national tours as a performer, I've done national tours as a stage manager. So I really understand both sides of it. And I think that's what's made me, you know, I, I like to think that I'm a, I'm a pretty good producer. You know, I, I, I work hard at it every day, but I really try to understand the actor's journey, the creative team's journey, the producer's journey, and finding that balance so all of those different aspects, you know, work together. Um, but I think it's, it was, it's stage management to me taught me everything that I know 
about theater. I mean, it, it's such a powerful um, learning tool to, to be able to work on a show that intimately. What was your self-talk and conversation to go from country music singer to producer? Was it, <laughs> was it like a, oh, I, I have to give this up? Or, you know, what was your thought process? You know, it, it's that, you know, that's sort of the first time that I went to New York and, you know, I, I, I did like the audition thing as a musical theater performer. Sure. You know, I, I was blonde, blue eyed, had a good voice, but there were so many people that were just like me. And, and, and one thing that I've, I, I've found in my career that's been so helpful sort of in everything that I do is, is you know, my niche, you know, what, what makes you unique? And I didn't feel as a performer that I had enough uniqueness about me to make me stand out and, and to support, you know, what I thought was going to be the career that I wanted. And also, to be perfectly honest with you, I just didn't enjoy the whole audition process. I didn't enjoy, you know, I have so much respect for performers to be able to to go to those lines and wait in those rooms and go through that audition process and look i've been in rooms of creative teams that are really great at auditions and i've been in rooms of creative teams that aren't great right. and and you know that that's it's tough for a performer and i have such respect for the people that that live and thrive off of it and really you know find success in it um you know it's interesting being on the other side of the table now um but i have such respect for it but it just wasn't for me you know, I, I just wanted a little bit more stability than that, than sort of having a job and then, you know, having to go find the next one. Um, I, I really, really enjoy the stability side um, of the of the producing side, which a lot of people say there's not a lot of stability producing, which is true too, especially <laughs> especially, especially these days. Yeah. But um, but you know that that was that was for me, and so I, I really found something that I I, I loved and enjoyed. And again, it, it just all comes back to the idea of taking a really great story and bringing it to life in a unique uh, way. Yeah, well, yeah. And to also make that, I mean, that's a big shift for career-wise. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going from, mm -hmm. not that actors are powerless, but that idea of the powerless kind of position to being full charge. <laughs> yeah. Literally in charge of every department, you know, of a musical yeah. production. Yeah, and, and what, what I enjoy about producing is the collaboration, right? Right. Is that, you know, no, no any producer that tells you that they're fully in charge is, is, is lying because you have to surround yourself by amazing people. Right. You know, the, producers absolutely support the process, but really the great producers put the right teams together and then just fan the flames. Right. That that's really what our function is, is to put the right. right people on the right project and let them go for it and let them create something really unique and special. And have input, of course, but just trust in the people that you hire to do the job as well. And did you know that from the beginning or was that learned for you halfway you know, through? It's just or? it was it was learned a lot, um, you know, being a stage manager because I I, I literally as a stage manager I think I I stage managed 13 national tours. So, you know, working with 13 different creative teams and seeing their process and seeing how they work with producers and working with producers that I thought were really great and some that were maybe not so great and just sort of learning. You know, you, you, you can learn from people that are amazing, but I actually learn from a lot of people that aren't so amazing. Um, yeah. I, think, I think every situation you're in, and at least in my career, has been... I, I've used it as a learning tool and I've had some great experiences and I've had some not so great experiences, but I think that my main goal coming out of everything is to take something away from it that I learned. Is there one that stands out, you know, and I'm not trying to make this some like, tell us a juicy story, but is there yeah. one, something that stands out in your mind that taught you a lot about yourself? Yeah. I mean, look, when you work on a show like Les Mis, and you work for a producer like Cameron that is so brilliant yeah. in, in, in what he's been able to create, you know, over the last 30 plus years is, is really amazing. And to see someone like that in a room do what he does and how, you know, a really great show can be made exceptional um, 
and 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 then at that point how detail oriented uh the process can become to really come out with something that's very special you know so i have a tremendous amount of respect for him yeah. um and 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 you know i, I ju- just to be in the room with some of those people you know over my career has been you know has been an incredible experience well, yeah, I mean, that's it's it's all about the relationships at that point. Mm, and, completely. And what I would imagine it's no mistake that you're still a part of, you know, Les Mis with networks at this point. Totally. Yeah. Well. And, you know, and, and along the way, getting to do Phantom of the Opera and doing Mary Poppins and and, and you know, learning an incredible amount um, yep. on those projects. What are your what are your views on relationships in the industry? How do you view uh, human connection? so to speak, within theater? Well, I mean, in the theater industry, and I would and I would argue, you know, I also own a business outside of theater. Uh, relationships are everything. Um, I, have, I have sat behind a casting table so many times to where it comes down to two candidates. And perhaps one candidate is a little bit better for the role but after the creative team has a discussion of, oh, I worked with this person, I worked with this person, they're so great to work with, they're such a great leader, they're a great company member, they end up getting the job. Perhaps the person that's not absolutely who the team wants, the people that are, are kind and people that people enjoy to work with will have a long, fruitful career in this industry. There will always be those that aren't pleasant that will do a few shows, but very few of those people can look sort of a, a long, a lifetime career and have longevity. The people that you really look at and that you know that have had these long, fruitful careers in our industry are, are gen- generally a pl- pleasure to work with yeah. and bring something really unique to the table. So I always tell people, I said, you know, it, no matter the situation, if you're in, if you're doing theater on Broadway to doing theater, you know, uh, in the middle of Tennessee somewhere, you know, every experience is an opportunity and sort of how you conduct yourself and how you have relationships with people um, is, is, is vital. And, and, and you, even when you're starting out, you know, those very first few years, it's super important to build those relationships because I promise you those people that you're with right now, are going to be with you and around you as you proceed forward in your career. I believe that. I'm starting to see a lot of familiar faces. <laughs> mm. <I> mean, <laughs> you see two things, age. right? <laughs> yeah, you see people that stay with you, and then you see people that leave the industry and never do theater again. It's like, you know, it's, it's really, it's sort of both ways. And people, you know, go their own way. But I, I you know, it's... um. It, you know, it's an arts community, right? And, and, and we're all very, very passionate people. And I think that, you know, passion and community and all of those things, when it comes together, that's those shows that are special. And, and I will say, like, I look across my career and there were definite, like, highlight moments. Obviously, Les Mis was one of those. Um, I worked on Rent for over two years. Rent was one of those very, like, highlight special moments. You know, th- there yeah. will be those moments in your career that, that sort of define it. And, and you sort of ask yourself when you're in those moments, how could it be any better than this? And that, that's what's special. Yeah. 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 I, there's, I have, I have many questions <laughs> uh, spanning your career in terms of uh, after Les Mis, yeah. what was your, what was your, what was your next path there? Because you had at this point, and I remember we talked about this a little bit, Oh, it must have been two months ago, you know, mm-hmm. with Cameron McIntosh, you become very close to yeah. people at the top because you are every, everyone in the room because you are literally as a stage manager communicating with everyone. <laughs> totally, <laughs> on totally. On stage, off stage, backstage, and in the house behind their designer Jeez. tables. Uh, yeah. What did that look like for you moving on from Les Mis? Well, you know, I had worked for the current company I worked for, Networks. I had worked for them, you know, on Les Mis early on, and I'd also done several projects for them as a stage manager before then. And there was a executive producer for the company um, named Kerry Walker, incredible guy um, that I had you know, developed a relationship with over the years, and he was going to retire. 
and his position was coming available um, at Network. So I met uh, with the rest of the team there. Um, I felt this had been a lot had been a long time coming. You know, it's something we had discussed openly. And um, the opportunity, the timing was right for me. You know, I was in New York doing Les Mis on Broadway. Um, and, you know, Broadway was definitely one of those things that I, I wanted to do in my career as a PSM. Um, but I, you know, I didn't see myself being a, a lifelong PSM. And it, that's not where I wanted my career to go. So I, this opportunity came up to come executive produce for networks. And I, it worked out and I took it. And, um, you know, I, I've worked with some really incredible people there, um, Seth Winnig and Ken Gentry. You know, I, I learned a tremendous amount from They have, you know, lifelong careers in this, especially in the touring industry. And um, sort of all the holes that I was missing from being a performer and then being a stage manager that I needed to be an effective producer, I learned and continue to learn, you know, even five years later, still learning. Um and so I sort of, that, that was like the last step in completing my picture. Obviously, you know, there's things I want to do in the future. Um, but that was, that, I felt that th this experience would make me whole and make me um, really have a 360 view of what I wanted to do in the industry. Yes, you're bringing up some really great names um uh, especially with seth as well you're yeah. i would i you know you know, i don't know necessarily that you call mentors mentors they just end up mentoring you yeah what uh do you have mentors and lessons that they've taught you specific things that stand out your mind i guess it could be in relation to producing tours because those are a whole different ball of wax yeah i mean yes i mean there, there's so much you know that that you learn from from and there are definitely some some people in my life that I've, I've learned a lot of like specific things from, but, you know, overall, I, I think the thing that I've taken away from the team that I'm with now is that, you know, people matter. Um, one thing I'm really, really happy about our company is, is we do try our best to take care of our people. And because we tend to work with people for multiple projects, people tend to come back to us and work for us over and over. And I think that that's something that is really special with our company and, um, and uh, really sort of puts me in a place to, you know, I'm really happy to work in that environment. And then also just understanding, you know, the balance as a producer, it's the constant balance, right, of the art and the fiscal responsibility. And when, when, when both of those items align and you have really the highest quality art possible in the most fiscally responsible manner, that is really when a show can be magic. And, and, and when those two things work together, that's when you've really succeeded. You know, we've all had shows that are maybe not artfully perfect and maybe cost way too much money and and, <laughs> and that's not it's not a good place to be it's right. really as a producer your constant balancing act is between those two um elements yeah and i feel like i do feel like you've answered this in, in a roundabout way i'm curious though how you've gotten better at communicating communicating mm. you know the fiscal responsibility or the art or just having to communicate with performers yeah i mean you just have to always know that you know in any leadership position right whenever you make a decision you're going to make some people happy and you're going to potentially upset others and th that's that's just sort of learning to be a leader 101 but even though those people that are perhaps upset about a decision that's made if you treat them with dignity, respect, and empathy, that respect comes back to you. So even though someone might not agree with every decision that you make, there will be an underlying tone of respect. And I think the key to communication is leading with respect. You will get respect back, and then it makes it that two-way street, right, where the two people can communicate. And versus sort of 
overlording something and, and trying to dictate, um, I don't find to be an effective form of leadership and communication. I think you really have to, you know, obviously right now what's going on in the world and not that we need to talk more about this, but this, this, this period we're in right now is incredibly challenging for performers. It's incredibly challenging for creatives, incredibly challenging for producers. We're all in this journey together and we're all learning every day what's next. And, and I think that, you know, a, a, as long as that sort of mutual respect and we're all in the trenches together working on a solution for our industry, I think we're going to come out strong on the other end. And I think that applies to anything. You know, it, when, when, you, when you're facing adversity or challenge, good communication and trust, which trust comes from respect, right, right. It, it is really the key um, for communication. And in transparency, you know, we're we're in a world these days where people don't want to hear bullshit anymore. You know, that's just it's just not yeah. it's not what people are up for. People just want transparency. Right. Right. They want you to be real with them. They might not always like your answers, but if you're real with people and and, and you're straightforward, people will respect that. They will. They will. And you're bringing up another fantastic point of the level headedness. Mm-hmm. That it's needed to not, you know, react when something lights on fire. It's more of a response. Yeah, and also, you know, I have, I live, you know, I live down in Charleston, South Carolina, and I, I have so many. I've made, I've, I've been here two and a half years now, and I've made some really good friends that, you know, are in the military, um, in the medical field, and and every day when they go to work. And, you know, or when my military friends are deployed to the Middle East or Coast Guard friends that are deployed down to South America, you know, they're making life and death decisions on a daily basis. And the one thing that I've come to realize about theater, we are a passionate group of people because we are all artists, of course. But at the end of the day, it's not life or death. Mm-mm. And I think that the moment that you find yourself, you know, getting fired up or, or, or stress or anxiety, just take a breath and realize, you know, we work in an industry to where we get to make people smile and we get to make people think about topics in a different way. And we get to work in an industry to where we can bring joy to people and take them out of whatever current situation they're in on this escape for this two or three hour journey. That's really, really special. And that's actually really, really powerful. Um, you know, just speaking of Les Mis, you know, Les Mis is, is such a story of, of redemption and hope and fighting for what you believe in. I think that's very, very relevant now as it was, you know, when Les Mis opened. And I think getting to bring that story to people on a, on a, on a nightly basis is something that's very, very powerful. So I think that that's a joy. And I also think you just have to keep a, a reality about yourself. You know, we're not, we're not in a war zone here um, in our industry. And um, I think, you know, sometimes uh, just a deep breath and, a, and the next step forward is, is really the best way to go versus, you know, letting yourself get all been out of shape about something. Do you meditate? You know, I'm not much of a meditator. I tend to enjoy, um, I, I sort of thrive in stressful situations. So <laughs> like my, my form of meditation would be, you know, I'm going to go run. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big CrossFitter. I own a CrossFit gym with my husband down in South Carolina. And I love sort of that, you know, torture element, um, because that to me is my escapism. And that's a bit my, um, my clarity, you know, when I'm, when I'm having a really tough workout, it's really kicking my ass. I, I have these great moments of clarity in that and everybody can find their, you know, their, their center or their Zen how, in many different forms, Sure, you know, meditation. I, I I've tried it. I would rather suffer a bit because I really find that I have a lot of great clarity and suffering. Um, 
and I, 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 it's just that's what works for me. But I, you know, it's different for everybody. Well, and this is another great point. I'm curious with with pain, your relationship mm. with pain. Mm -hmm. Where do where does that come from, and how have you configured that in your mind? If you've thought about it to this degree of your relationship with pain, right? Well, what I've learned about sort of you know the human body, we can talk about you know there's the theater side of me, and there's also the health and fitness side, which I'm as equally passionate about. Yeah. But you know your 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 brain is is designed in a way, you know to 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 tell you to stop before your actual body will break down. But for instance, like in, in, um, in January, I was, I'm, I'm not a runner. Like I'm, I'm a runner in the fact that I'll go run a 5k. I'm not a marathon runner, but last year about this time, I said, I want to, I want to go to Disney world in January and I want to run what's called the dopey challenge. And it's a four day race and it's a 5k, a 10k, a half marathon and a full marathon sequentially across the four days. Um, Jeez. <laughs> 46 miles and so you know i started training over the summer and, and making my distances longer and longer but you never really experience what that's going to be until you actually run the race because it, you know it's 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 about getting up at three o'clock in the morning for a 5 a.m gun at the start line each day you know it's it all sort of adds up yeah but when I ran that race, and, and Alan ran it, Alan's my husband, he ran it with me. You know, you run day one, day two, day three, you run the half, you're good to go, and we get into the marathon. And to this day of my life, you know, that, that has been the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life. Because it's not just a marathon, you know, you've already run almost a marathon up to that point. Um, and then you still have a marathon ahead of you. Right, right. Um, but I, I learned so much about myself. I, I and on top of having a massive respect for the endurance and, and, and long distance running community. Um, but I, I learned so much about myself. I had so much clarity about some upcoming career decisions that I want to make um, just by being th there's a, there's a little window that's beyond when your brain tells you to stop, but before your body breaks down, <laughs> There's a little window in there that to me, if you can find that window and sort of get comfortable being uncomfortable, um, you can learn a lot. You can learn a lot about yourself and, um, and have some real moments of, you know, those aha moments that you have in your life. But it's about finding that little window for are, me. Are you willing to share any of the aha moments you've had in that window? Yeah, I mean... You know, it, it, it's funny. So, so, so many people, when you start your career, it's about pleasing other people, right? You, you are trying to impress other people. And over, you know, the last 10 years, especially when CrossFit and now running has come into my life, one of the big aha moments was like, okay, I've worked so hard to get where I'm at and I have worked to impress people. Now I'm going to do this for me and, and I'm going to do it on my terms and I, and I don't really need to impress anyone. I just want to be good at what I do. And I, I want to move from trying to impress someone to gaining respect from people just by how I, how I work. And so I think, you know, you, you learn in a lot of the aha moments were like really about those moments in life to take time for myself and to make sure that I'm good. Um, because I, you know, I do have a tendency to, to want to take care of others. I always have been that way in my life, but I think that, um, you know, I, I, my, I, every year I, I, I start with this sentence that I'm like, what what I want my overarching mission statement to be for this year. And last year it was, you know, build a life that you don't need a vacation from. And that's not that you don't need to take vacations, but build a life that you're happy living day in and day out. And you feel like, man, I got to get away from this place where well, you don't feel that way. Right. Um, and so that's been really, you know, my goal of the last 
you know, year and a half now. Um, and I think, you know, I've had a lot of clarity of, of those moments sort of when I've been running or in a really tough workout. Um, and it's, it's worked for me. Yeah. It's, it sounds freeing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I have a hard time sitting still, right? You know, I, 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 I enjoy, like when I do yoga, I feel amazing afterward. But just that, just that hour of being so still is very challenging for me because I'm such. I, I just want to get up and go a lot, right. um, and so I sort of found something that works for me to, you know, obviously to let out all my energy, but also to find those moments that, um, those moments of clarity that I think that, uh, you know, you, you you need to to seek out. Do you have morning rituals or ways in which you start your day? Yeah, I mean. Sleep before the morning ritual. Yeah. Sleep, I've learned, is incredibly important to me. And the difference that I am, both health and fitness wise, to my mental state, from a seven hour night sleep to a nine hour night sleep is vast. Mm. If I get seven hours, I'm, I'm not at 100% on many levels. But once I can get between eight and ideally nine hours is key to me. So if I can hold on to that schedule, I know that I'm setting myself up for success. In the morning, I tend to ramp up. I, I wake up. The first thing that I don't want to do in the morning is grab my phone. It, it's such a habit that I had for a long time that I was attached to my cell phone. So now my phone automatically at night goes on do not disturb until 9 a.m. So I have from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. It goes on Do Not Disturb, and I don't mess with it. Yeah. Um, and so when I wake up in the morning, I get my day started sort of free of that. I have my dogs here. You know, I take care of them. I kind of ramp up into my day. Then I get on, you know, 9, check the emails, do that sort of thing, get caught up, ready for my day to start at 10. I work my day. But also at 6 p.m., that's my day because, you know, I do work from home, which is, you know, I'm, everybody's working from home now. But what's right. very, very key to working remotely, which is obviously becoming more and more, even outside of COVID-19, people are working from home. You have to really set parameters on what your work day is like. And so I work 10 to 6. And then at 6 p.m., it becomes my time again. And that's when I go work out and I do all my things at night. Um, but I think you have to have that kind of structure because if you don't, as I did in the beginning, I would find myself at 10 o'clock at night on my computer, you know, working, sending emails and doing all this stuff and you really have to structure it. Yeah, that's that, I mean, the self-discipline of working from home is, yeah. you know, cause you still have to keep the office, the office, even though it's in your home. It's yeah. And our home. whole, I, yeah. And our whole office is remote right now. And, you know, there are some people like us that normally work remote that, that have a system and then others that are actually finding a really hard time switching over to being at home. Oh yeah. I believe that, especially if, you know, part of your ritual is the commute. You know, totally getting, getting to work. Uh, totally. I I'm curious if there mm -hmm. are any mistakes that have been made that have proved essential in learning in uh, your life. Yeah, I mean, my goodness, uh, you know, I uh, you know I've made all kinds of mistakes, and I, I just think the key to it is 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 just know when they're mistakes and own them. And I always say, you know, if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail big. Uh, mm. And because what, what, what you don't want to do when you're taking on a project, you're taking on a job or, or, or opening a small business like I have, you, you don't want to like dip your toe in. You got to jump into the pool. And by jumping into the pool, you have to own and accept that you're going to make mistakes. But you're going to learn from those mistakes. And it's that whole thing, right? I never fail, you know, either I win or I learn, mm -hmm. you know, there's no such thing as a fail. You know, if, if something doesn't go our way, we're going to learn from it or we're going to win the day. So if, if you're going to, if, if you're going to do something, whatever it is in life, then, you know, you need to go a hundred percent in and, and have no regrets and not fear 
a mistake. So many people that I talk to, and I have a few people that you know use me as a business mentor. That there, there, there is this inherent sort of fear of taking risk, and uh, any project that I start, I'm just as nervous starting that project as the very first project in my life that I started, because I don't think I think if you don't have those sort of nerves, you're not in a good place to, to really try to attack something. And nerves are okay, but you have to take risk and you have to put yourself out there on the line to go for it, and. Um, you know, you, you don't, you never want to see something not work out and be like, you know, if I would have just done that, or if I would have just taken a bit more risk, maybe this would have worked out. You just can't live with that kind of pressure of regret. Um, you just got to go for it. Have you gotten, has it gotten easier taking risks? Yes, because you give less fucks. <laughs> um, yeah. Ultimately. Sure. But, um, you know, I, I just encourage people to be bold and, 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 and people will respect that if you, if you just, uh, if, if you just take a chance. I'd be, I'd be remiss if I did not bring up 1776. Oh the, yeah. The upcoming epic with Diane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the, absolutely, you would be the brainchild behind that. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny because, um, I had worked with Diane on uh, Finding Neverland and had an incredible experience with her, have so much respect for for what she's done in all her shows, and obviously big fans of shows like Pippin and Hare and Porgy and Bess and everything. But um, Oren Wolf, who um, you know, is the, the pro- he, he's a producer at Networks, but also produced the band's visit on Broadway, had always wanted to do a, a female production of 1776, um, we didn't know what was going to happen. It was sort of not happening. We were going down one path and it wasn't working out. And I just said, Orin, I said, look, let me take a chance here. Let me call Diane and see if she has any interest in this. Um, I, I called Diane. Diane you know, had heard of the show, but didn't know it intimately. And, um, I sent her the, the libretto and everything. And she took a flight to London and read it on the flight and, called me and said, I, I got to know two things. I, she said, uh, uh, is it factually accurate? Which it is. And um, can we open it at American Repertory Theater? And we said, absolutely. So, you know, with Oren and myself, uh, we, uh, we got it going again. And, you know, when you, when you have someone like Diane come onto a project, it becomes very exciting. Um, you know, she has taken an initial nugget of an idea that, that we had and is really developing something that's, that's spectacular. Um, can't share a lot about that now, but, um, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's very exciting. I think it's very timely. I love the idea that this show is going to be around the U.S. Um, just like it should be. You know, these states coming together to, to put this production online and um i think it uh i'm very very excited about it yeah it's nice when things things work out and it's highly anticipated so i'm excited to just see yeah see what what it will be we all are we're just waiting to get through our current situation and then um get our path planned but um but thankfully um america patoy theater's been great roundabout's been great for new york and um and the touring markets are ready for it. People are very excited about it. So we are um, thrilled to put it out there in the world. As we wrap up here, I got two final yep. questions for you. Uh, okay. In life, what's most mm-hmm. important to you? Mm. Very Family. Family is everything. And family can be whatever you make it. But mm. without family and without a support system around you, um, life is very hard. And, and I, I, and, you know, so early in my career, career was first and my sort of ambition always came first, but I've learned that having a family, uh, is super important to, um, to everything in life and just flat out at the end of this, it's just joy. It's just what life is all about. Um, so that's an easy one. Family. If you could metaphorically put a word or a phrase on a billboard for millions of mm. people to see, 
Does anything come to mind? Um, yeah, I think I would go back to the, the phrase that I would put would be, you know, never fail, win or learn. And I, I think that I, I live my life by that. Um, and I, I think that uh, a lot of people could benefit from that. To change that in the mind, it, yeah. un- it unlocks. <laughs> it, so I, I, completely, completely it does. Wow. This has been a whirlwind of a conversation. Thank you for taking the time to <laughs> chat with me, Trinity. I feel like great. we took a deep dive. It's a pleasure. Hey, and it's great having you on The Waitress. You're amazing in it. Oh, thank you so much. I know. It's going to be exciting to see what the future of theater is. And I know. And how it transforms the way we <laughs> come together. <laughs> Absolutely. As a human race. So we'll Well, thank we'll you, see. sir. Uh, Take care and be safe out there. Yes, you as well. Is there anything else you want to add before we finally wrap this bad boy up? No, just just know, you know, I, I, I tell people, I said, you know, this, this time that we're right now, it will not define us. It will reveal who we are. So let's just keep up the good fight and work together. And uh, we'll get to the other side. We will. Thank you. Ladies, All right, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Trinity Wheeler. You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another curiosity conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.